Okay, so I'm the first speaker. So what I'm going to do is get us all on the same page. So um, we there's some of the stuff that I'm going to cover that you probably already know. But what I'm going to do is make sure that we've got a background to the discussion that's going to happen further so that when we sit down and talk about things on the panel discussion, everybody's basically starting from the same point. So my um, talk is designed to be pretty much of an outline and really pretty basic. Okay, so I've called it G is for Google, H is for Harry and L is for library. As I was introduced, this is me. Uh, you're very, very welcome to take notes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to upload all my slides to my blog librariansmatter.com. So I tend to talk fast. So if you um, find that you can't take down what you want to, you can always go back, check at librariansmatter.com and by Monday I'll have the slides up. Okay, so I'm going to start off talking about what we might mean by a Google world. I'm going to then move on to the Harry Potter world and compare that briefly to the library world. Then I'm going to talk about some so what's from what's just gone before. Now, as always, I had much more material to cover than um, I had time. So what I've done is I'm, I'm going to jump actually from the backgrounding to just 10 ideas that may seem like quite a jump. And that's actually deliberate because what I want to do is maybe if you can't actually see why I'm drawing those conclusions, let's talk about it in the panel afterwards. Okay, so what I want you to do is, don't call this out yet, um, there'll be a point where this is relevant, but what I want you to do is just do a bit of thinking. I went to Google, Google Images, I typed in a search term and I produced this result. So what I want you to do is work out what search term I probably put in. Okay, most of you will have it by now. If you don't, we're coming back to it. Okay, so I'm going to start off with the Google world. And when I'm talking about the Google world, what I'm really talking about is changes to how people find information. Now, I'm not saying changes to how people find information online, because a lot of sources that were once offline have now become online sources. So it's generally how people find information, even though we're talking about the online world. So when you think of Google, is this what you think about? An actual physical place, a location. This is um, on the 31st of December last year. Um, I had my friend Karen, when I was in California, take me to the Google campus in Mountain View. So there we are, we're standing at a physical place. Uh, I was so excited that when I drove past Google, I got their, their Wi-Fi that I took a screenshot. And of course, we drove past and we saw this car. And next to this Google car, which makes Google Maps, there's this little drop pin, which, you know, it amused me. So when you think of Google, do you think, oh, well, they must mean that physical venue, that physical place? It's not what I tend to think about, but we've got a bit of a um, schizophrenic um, two-faced existence here in library land because we're wanting people to think of brand library as a place to find information online, or that's what a lot of our efforts seem to be um, put towards but we also want them to think of us as a venue and as a place. And there's no way that people think of Google or Amazon as a place. And we need to think about what that means. Okay, so Google's mission, I told you we're getting, I was getting back to basics and going to lay down some foundations. Google's mission, according to them, is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Now, um, when I was earlier um, last year revising some notes for something called Introduction to Libraries where I work, um, I came across a concept and a term that I remember from my library school days and it's actually a way that we're still maybe trapped in thinking about and about our relationship to information and knowledge. Okay, so I'm just going to remind you again, Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Now the term that I'm thinking of is bibliographic universe. Okay, so we were teaching and we were taught that um, there was this way of transmitting knowledge through print that was known as the bibliographic universe. That was all the information that could be found in print in libraries and as librarians we had bibliographic control. Well that's what we aimed for. We aimed to organize and make universally accessible this bibliographic universe. Now I would argue that we are still thinking a lot like that however we're not the people who's, who are doing it anymore and we maybe need to think about whether we're still in the business of doing it in quite the same way and quite the same way that we sometimes think about ourselves. Okay, 
Google has, since 1995, these 10 things they know to be true. And I'm just going to go through them very quickly. And some of them are great and can apply to libraries. And some of them outline the differences that we have. Okay, so first thing, focus on the user and all else will follow. It's best to do one thing really, really well. Fast is better than slow. Democracy on the web works. You don't need to be at your desk to need an answer. You can make money without doing evil. There's always more information out there. The need for information crosses all borders. You can be serious without a suit. And great just isn't good enough. Now we could spend a whole day discussing these and how they relate to library values. I'm not going to. What I am going to do is focus on this one. It's best to do one thing really, really well. And Google defines that one thing as search. That's the sliver of Google that I'm going to look at today. So I know that there's Google Talk, there's Google Reader, there's Google Book Settlement, there's what's happening with Blogger, there's Google Plus. I'm not bringing that into the discussion. We could discuss that. Okay, I'm focusing on search. So going back, and again, as I said, I'm just getting us all so that we know we're, that we're on, in the same spot. You would know that the way that Google traditionally, or the way that the secret source to Google originally, was this thing called PageRank, named after Larry Page, one of the founders, not after web pages. So you've got your happy yellow page up in the top uh, left right-hand corner there, and that yellow happy page is happy because it will be ranked higher in a Google search because it has more authoritative websites pointing toward it. So the page rank, the secret source of Google was once, okay, we'll look and see who's pointing to what. Of course, it was very easy to game with search engine optimization. So it's not exactly, or even very much, how Google does search now. But a lot of librarians are still thinking about Google search if they're thinking about it at all, at all as being like this. Okay, what I want to do is look a bit about the, the, the reason why Google exists. And this is from their, um, it's a blog entry called Ad Perfect from the official Google blog in 2010. And I think it actually sums up very nicely what they're about. Okay, we will continue to live by the philosophy that has guided our work from the outset. Getting the right ad to the right person at the right time matters. Okay, so as I'm sure you realize that we are not, the searchers are not the customers, the customers of Google are the advertisers. If you're not paying for it, you're not the customer, you're the product being sold. That's attributed to a Metafilter user, who's somebody who used one of the big query sites, called Blue Beetle. Okay, that's the best attribution, but it's still a nice quote, as in, if you're not paying for it, your click-throughs, your eyeballing are what's being sold to the advertiser. It's um, so important that even when I play Angry Birds, it will offer me to go and search on Bing, to advertise Bing. They really want my click-throughs. Okay, so... Google has its own values and its own aims, some of them quite close to libraries. It uses PageRank. Now, let's have a look closer at search. Okay, here's the name of that search. The first one is this one. Okay, and you've worked out what the term is? Yeah, the term's boxer. So boxer could mean underpants, boxer could mean somebody who's in a sporting match, or boxer could be this breed of dog. Let's try another one. Name that search for this one. Okay. Little harder, but, but kind of straightforward. Mercury, okay? So Mercury is a planet, and actually I'm going to put this up on the screen. When you as a person have a look at this, one of the things that you actually know and have been able to work out and is part of the reason why you as a person are better than this Google image search is that you know in your world knowledge you've got Mercury is a planet somewhere available to you. Of course, down in the lower left-hand corner of this, you've also got Mercury is an element, and we've got Mercury is a rock star when we're talking about Freddy. Mercury is also a winged messenger of the gods, and Mercury is apparently also an outboard motor. Okay, so we used to feel kind of smug in libraries because if this little guy came across the desk and wanted to um, find out a 
an answer from us, we'd be able to help him increase the quality of the question. We'd be able to use our knowledge to use context to really get the right answer. And this is actually where a lot of librarians are sitting at the moment in, in their relationship to Google. They're feeling quite smug. Well, maybe we need to stop feeling quite so smug and pay a bit more attention to what's going on. Okay, so Google has gone way beyond PageRank. One of the ways that Google has gone beyond PageRank in order to produce results is through personalization. I'm going to talk about three elements of personalization. But first, a cartoon. 1993, New Yorker, famous cartoon, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. So people might have been able to check your IP address, see that it comes from the Happy Valley Kennels maybe, but there was very little way that you could be identified when you posted on a forum or when you did a search on Google about who you were. Eli Pariser, and it's very worth checking out his TED Talk about the filtered bubble, the TED, T-E-D, talk, the video online talk. He's written something called The Filter Bubble, all about personalization in search. And this is his quote about 2011. In 2011, the internet doesn't just know you're a dog. It knows your breed and wants to sell you a bowl of premium kibble. Okay, so one, it's a commercial environment, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. If these search engines didn't produce the right searches for people, then they wouldn't be funded by advertisers who want that, those click-throughs. So there actually needs to be some kind of check on the accuracy and not serving of too much biased information or else people would go somewhere else, like duckduckgo.com. Duckduckgo.com, it claims to be a non-filtered um, um, search engine. Okay, first way that um, personalization might work is through cookies. These are little bits of knowledge that get added to your browser. They help the browser remember who's been where. Um, they're kind of pervasive. So if you go to dictionary.com and type in the word depression, 233 tracking cookies and beacons get added to your browser. Now, this is kind of concerning, and it's so concerning that on the 29th of May in the UK, legislation was um, started that means that you can't actually have cookies put into your browser without your permission, which is interesting. But for now, there's cookies track that are changing what you see on the web after you've visited that site. For example, they'll be trying to sell you Zoloft rather than a Hawaiian holiday because they know you're more likely to be depressed. Okay, the other thing that um, is being used in personalization is your search history. Now, unless on the 1st of March when Google changed its terms you scrubbed your history or when you first created your Gmail account if you have one you said please don't track my searches, I'd like you to go home tonight and go to www.google.com forward slash history and you will see the history of every search you've ever done on Google when you've been logged into your Gmail account. Okay, so for me it says, hey, don't you want to turn web history on? I suggest you go and see it. When I turned my web history off on the 1st of March, my search, um, searches that I did on Google became a lot less precise. It had five years worth of um, search information on me. It knew that if um, I was putting in mercury, I was going to go for the rock star every time rather than the element. And I lost that precision when I lost, um, when I said, please don't keep my history. The other thing that um, Google will be looking at when it personalizes your results is the social graph, okay? So something like Google+, Plus, which we know doesn't rival Facebook, I don't think it ever was meant to, but what it did do is in the first couple of months of Google+, Plus, Google's attempt at a social network, it sucked all of us, or many of us, into revealing our social graph. Who we knew, knew we put them in circles, we divided it up. So in terms of disambiguating people, so here's some people, one of them being Kate Davis, who's just over there. Um, it knows that probably given that these 300 people say that they know Kate Davis and that these people, these people, and they've all got the world librarian in their cycle, circles, that there's a Kate Davis over there and she's probably not the Kate Davis who plays rugby in Canada. Okay, so it's actually being able to disambiguate when you're talking about a person. It knows that if I'm typing or doing a search on Kate Davis, I'm probably searching for librarian Australian Kate Davis, not rugby um, Canadian Kate Davis. But this is interesting. I was um, preparing for this forum and, of course, when I then clicked through to Google+, it gave me Kate, Francis and Carol, Carol's um, Google+. Um, Plus profiles and said, you might want to add these people. 
The upshot of um, the social circle though is that if Carol, for example, has done lots of searches on Mercury the element, and I'm always clicking through to Mercury the rock star, it makes it more likely that Mercury the element is going to appear in my search results because it knows that we're friends. In fact, if we're close friends with a lot of interactions and a lot of very, very similar people, it will pay more attention to what Carol is doing and it will affect my search more than otherwise. Okay, so the first thing is personalization. The next thing that Google is doing, and Bing, is semantic analysis. What I'm going to do is I'm going to mention a few terms and what I would like you to do is next time you hear these terms and people talking to you about them, don't bury your head over, under your doona and say this is nothing to do with me. I want you to prick up your ears and think how is this going to affect me and what I do. Okay, So this is designed just to be, hey listen, here's some terms, you might need to think about these sometime. Okay, so. With semantic analysis, the idea is that you can ask a question in natural language and the computer will be able to work out the context and what you mean. And a lot of what they're doing is they're doing it through personalization. However, something like Mercury as a planet, we might kind of understand that. If the sentence though is Mercury as a boxer, we might have a bit of a problem, okay? Is it that we've got a friend who's got a really fast dog so they named it after the um, messenger of the gods so Mercury as a boxer makes sense in that context? Or is it that Freddie is going to do a couple of rounds in the ring? We don't necessarily know. However, with personalization, Google may well know before we do when that search is happening. Now, with semantic analysis, You've got um, PowerSet, which has been bought out by Bing. You've got MetaWeb, which has been bought out by Google. And these are two companies that understand how to make search terms more relevant and more understandable, um, natural language input more understandable by search engines. So what you've got is you've got, this doesn't appear for me in Australia yet. Um, this is the knowledge graph. This is from my friend Stephen who um, in the US put in the word boxer. Now what this is displaying isn't, you know how you scroll down um, the, the Google search now and it will show you what's on the entire page if you, you sort of sit there long enough. That isn't this. What this space here is, is this is a place where it disambiguates the term. So it, um, if it was um, an artist for example, it would have history of the artist. What they're trying to do here is keep you on Google in the search engine so you're more likely to click through to their advertisers rather than going somewhere else and clicking through to their advertisers. And you can see here, here's a people also search for. Okay, So it's actually worked out through whatever means that probably um, what Stephen is interested in is uh, boxer dogs. So that's one way that it's using semantic analysis to actually give you information so you stay in Google. The other thing that it's doing is it's using something called a triple. Okay, Triples are the building blocks of the semantic webs. Most information can be expressed as a triple. As a tri and this is where um, we need to pay a bit, bit more attention. Okay, So Mercury is a boxer is an example of subject, predicate, object. Okay, And anything that can be expressed as subject, predicate, object can become a triple. So something like J.K. Rowling wrote Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. There'll be another triple somewhere which is J.K. Rowling is an author and author writes books and then building up and up and up a whole lot of triples that t tell the whole story of um, semantically how to unpack the sentence J.K. Rowling wrote Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Now what's done with this, this type of triple, is we might do a search on Wikipedia for J.K. Rowling. Now within Wikipedia there's something called DBpedia, like databasepedia. And this is standardized information that can be exposed to other data sets in a way that can tap into that understanding of the semantic um, expression of terms. So DBpedia is something with which you're familiar. It's this bit. Okay, so this little um, box here is a set of standardized information and data. It will be birth dates for um, software. It would be the date that it was first published. So it's all these things that are more or less expressed as triples, nationality, J.K. Rowling is British. British is a nationality, for example. Okay, so what that means is now that data is available to go and play. This is an old representation of something called the linked open data universe. Again, just a term, know about it next time. DBpedia 
links through to something called Libris, which is the Swedish National Library's catalogue. Okay, so what we've got now is we've got DBpedia information going through and coming into Libris, okay? That Libris data can then go and play with Project Gutenberg. It could go and play with the BBC programs. Okay, so all these webs of data that's in standardized ways, expressed as triples, expressed in ways that machines can then understand much more sophisticatedly than they used to what is being asked. It can all go and play and be mashed up together. However, in libraries, we're still presenting people with something like this and expecting them to have an information experience, okay? We need to really think about what we're doing when we're trying to present information online and provide solutions and whether we've got any competition at all and whether this is a worthwhile enterprise. I'm not saying it's not, but we need to understand how people are getting their information otherwise. Okay, on to Harry Potter world. And what I'm more or less talking about is changes in the way that people get content. So one thing is that with the Harry Potter books, there's definitely a library role. We all celebrated Harry Potter. Lots and lots of people came in. They wanted to borrow the books. We could do a lot of tie-ins, a lot of activities. But it also brings up a few problems or issues around content supply. The first one is transliteracy, which is a term that I don't particularly go for. It's nice shorthand. The idea is that Harry Potter is a story to my kids. Isn't just the books. For them, it's more likely to be Stephen Fry reading aloud. For the last two years, they've had it on almost non-stop in their bedrooms. All I can hear is Stephen Fry talking, talking Harry Potter. But to them, actually, um, in terms of how they've consumed the book, it's much more an audio book. They also play this an awful lot, which is the Lego Harry Potter world. Okay, they've got the Lego T-shirts. They play Lego scene it. To them, there's the movies. There's a whole... Harry Potter universe that we need to acknowledge isn't just a book if we're actually going to be able to relate to the people who want to find this leisure and recreation information. Now I qualify that with when I explain this to my kids about what I thought one of them said no it's the best book series ever. Okay so I may not be right on that that all kids are like that. Okay, Harry Potter brings up the issue of piracy. As we know, J.K. Rowling didn't allow e-books to be licensed when she first um, published Harry Potter series. So they were pirated. You go to Pirate Bay, you type in Harry Potter, and you can see book after book after book that you can download illegally for free. And that's how people were getting their Harry Potter e-books if they wanted Harry Potter e-books. Okay, so the issue of piracy is one that the Harry Potter brings up. Now. There's no gimpy branch of Pirate Bay. That sounds kind of obvious, but technically, technically, geographic location doesn't matter with e-content. Somebody in Gympie, somebody in Sweden, somebody in an African country, if they had an inter connection to the internet, could all go to Pirate Bay, the single location, and download from that e-content site. They don't think of what local site am I going to go to download my e-content. Harry Potter brings up the issue of author control. Uh, J.K. Rowling has released Pottermore along with Sony, but what she's doing is she's asserting the um, association of the users with J.K. Rowling as the originator of Harry Potter, not the publisher, not the library. And there's a lot more that could be said about that that I'm not going to say, but the idea that authors are becoming more directly involved with distribution of their own work is one that we really need to think about. Harry Potter, um, our experience with Harry Potter has brought up the idea that we rent e-content rather than buy it, okay? Something in Overdrive, we have to keep paying this, the subscription. We don't own it, all we do is provide an authentication login, okay? It brings up the divide and conquer sales model. This is insane, okay? Penrith City Library, I want to download Harry Potter, I get this interface. The URL is penrithlib.overdrive.com. I want to go to Gold Coast Libraries, download Harry Potter, goldcoast.lib.overdrive.com. Brisbane Yarra Plenty Download Collection, Harry Potter, brisyprl, lib.overdrive.com. Okay, they're all going to the same URL. This is craziness on the part of what we've accepted, what we've negotiated, what works. Okay, I'm not saying that we're in a position or power to change it, but we do need to recognise that just like there's no gimpy branch of Pirate Bay, for some reason we're forcing our users online to associate with a geographical um, provision that is just terribly artificial and I think we maybe need to work towards a bigger 
library brand overreaching for e-content for us to really be taken seriously as content providers. Okay, does Harry Potter equal war? Amazon.com, Kindle Owners Lending Library, 19th of June, just the other day. Harry Potter becomes available through the Kindle Owners Lending Library. This is available to people with Kindle devices in the United States. When they announced that this was going to ha happen, and you can't read the whole thing, I'm just showing you the pretty scroll, it was with Dear Muggles, and this was from Jeff Bezos, um, talking about how it was wonderful that there was going to be Harry Potter in the Kindle Lending Library. But there was a shot across the bow. This is what they said, and I love the use of the word traditional in this statement. Okay, with traditional library lending, the library buys a certain number of ebook copies of a particular title. If all of these are checked out, you have to get on a waiting list. For popular titles like Harry Potter, the wait can sometimes be months. With Kindle Owners Lending Library, there are no due dates. You can borrow as frequently as once a month, and there are no limits on how many people can simultaneously borrow the same title, so you never have to wait in line for the book you want. In other words, we're Amazon, borrow from us. We've set ourselves up as a pseudo library, as a better library than you're going to be getting from your public library because you have to wait for so jolly long. Okay, so they're very, very explicitly, not only um, have the big six done some really strange things with um, pre presenting their content in um, Overdrive or not presenting it, we've got Amazon saying, well, we've, because we can do this with publishers, we're going to be better than your local public library. Okay, Library World. I'm not actually going to mention these things. Oh, 2005, Perceptions of Libraries and Information Resources. Um, the first thing that comes to mind when thinking about the library, OCLC report for books was 69%. By 2010, same report, first thing that comes to mind when thinking about the library, books wasn't 69%, it was 75%. It had gone up. What are we going to do about that? I don't really have time to go through the IFLA um, Public Library Service guidelines, but it's talking about the purpose of the public library, and this is one of the um, points that I think is really important. Libraries have an important role in the development and maintenance of a de democratic society by giving the individual access to a wide and varied range of knowledge, ideas and opinions. Important role in the development and maintenance of a democratic society. So this is one that, something that the International Federation of Library Associations in their guidelines for public libraries think is very important. Me too, by the way. Okay, so I'm just going to go really quickly in the next four minutes through what to me are some of the so what's as a result of what I've been saying. Okay, the first thing is we should be using consortia to provide, supply the generics and I don't really care if you think you can't get along, we have to. Okay, things like those 500 copies of Harry Potter that were distributed in libraries across, across Queensland. There's no reason why they can't be done through a generic supplier. There's going to be generic bestsellers that every library user wants delivered in print. We can just get some other agency to do that. We know we're going to have to supply them. Let's get somebody else to do it. Same with e-content. There needs to be, there has to be a consortium for e-content if we're actually going to associate in our user's mind that libraries are a site for getting e-content and if we're not going to be divided and conquered in terms of what the publishers want us to bend over and pay for. Okay, and there are precedents for that in Canada and other places. Focus on the deeply local, okay? You have data, you have information, you have information needs that no other library can be fulfilling. There's a um, remit, I think, that we need to get a lot of local information, local history digitised. We need to get metadata added to it and we need to get it in a form that lets it be exposed as linked open data and be reused so that the rest of humanity can benefit from what we know. Okay, idea three, not all of our potential users obey the law when obtaining content. We need to know about those information sources because to me, illegal content supply is actually a hidden competitor for the libraries. If a counsellor sees teenage kids downloading the latest Harry Potter ebooks and doesn't really know where they're getting them from, for you to go to the counsellor and say, we need to provide your children with Harry Potter ebooks, give us some money for overdrive, it's not going to be such a compelling argument. If people feel like the need is being met, even if it's being done illegally, we need to understand that this is a competitor and there's actually a um, perception that maybe our legal model is not as good as the illegal model that they can use. Okay, public libraries should not be funded to serve everyone. There's a group of people whose information needs are being met 
thank you very much just nicely that once had their information needs met by the public library. We maybe need to think, okay, we're open to everybody, but maybe the people who um, have low literacy levels, who are poor, who have English as a second language, who are young, who are elderly, who are disabled, who don't otherwise have information seeking ability, are the people that we need to focus much more on and we need to be more selective in the funding that we're asked for, asking for. Hybridise. Drop the word library if necessary. Um, there's a convergence of art galleries, of museums, of um, public broadcasters, storytellers, libraries. We may find ourselves being sharing our expertise and being the one venue and the one institution. I think we need to get, get over it and maybe actually join together to see what we can do to change and democratise society. Okay. Idea seven, poor old Gimpy. There's no Gimpy branch of Google, which means we need to value venue as much as um, understand that we're competing in a world where people think of um, information provision as a single um, international monolith as well. Okay, So we need to actually think about those venues that we have and actually um, advertise them as a value. Idea eight, democracy, advocacy and community are our point of difference. We need to push that. Idea nine, report outcomes, not outputs. This is from a paper being presented at the IFLA conference by somebody who's looking at the value of libraries in the Netherlands. And his idea is that um, outputs are things you can count, like numbers of volumes, numbers of users. Outcomes are the so what, what difference does it make? And the last idea I want to leave you with is to stop doing one thing, then stop doing another. When's the last time you looked at what your library did? And apart from deaccessioning the videos, because that's kind of easy, deaccessioning the, the tape cassettes, that's kind of easy stuff. When did you actually look and think things are changing, we need to stop doing some stuff, and then we need to stop doing something else to make room for maybe a changing role? Okay, I'll hand over to the others now. Thank you. Here's my media credits.